The last uh, paper is implementation of and evaluation of uh, 50 kilohertz, 28 microsecond motion to pause latency head tracking instrument. And Henry will Henry Fuchs will present this work. Thank you. This is um, work of uh, Alex Blait. Uh, one of our PhD students uh, advised by Mary Witten, who's here. Is Mary here? Uh, Mary Witten and myself. And Mary says she just signed off on his dissertation before she left. Uh, the rest of the authors are his committee and Andre State, who's as much a member of the committee as the rest of it. Um, if you ever want to know why many of us like being at UNC, this is one of the reasons. Every week, almost the entire committee shows up for this. Okay, so if you don't want to read the paper, here are the results. This is a sixth off optical tracker that runs at 50 kilohertz. For those of you that um, use trackers, most people I don't think have trackers that work at one kilohertz faster. So this is maybe 50 times faster. Okay, why would we want that? Well, it's because a few years ago, uh, we built a really fast display system that has latencies of 80 microseconds, but we couldn't have anything use it because we didn't have any tracker that was fast enough. We used a mechanical, really terrible mechanical tracker for it. So here is a tracker that will keep up with that. If you want to know why you would want to do something like that, if you just look at, um, say, a telepresence kind of meeting where some of the people are local and some are distant, if you just follow a conversation back and forth, those people are, are going to be swimming like this, which is not going to be tolerable. Okay, so if you wonder how can you build a tracker that's at 50 kilohertz, the first answer is you can't do it with cameras. <laughs> the second answer is use lateral effect photodiodes, uh, which a number of uh, previous fast trackers have used, including our uh, highball tracker from 25 years ago. But here, it's not a large area that we want. All we want is to test the subject who's sitting here <laughs> and moving their head back and forth. So a small area is okay and we could have a large uh, LED that's powerful on the head, and we can uh, have uh, small, narrow field of view cameras. And so using a lateral effect photodiode, for those of you that don't know, uh, that they don't form an image. They basically, uh, light induces leakage currents. And so if, if you measure the, um, the current at the four electrodes at the edges, then if you have a point light source, then you could get X and Y values directly. And you could do that really fast. How fast can you do it? Well, it depends on what the noise floor is. And if you have really um, high, very bright LEDs, and you have narrow field of view lenses, and you have uh, really good uh, digital to analog converters, you could run this at 50 kilohertz. And so you turn on one of these at a time, and you do triangulation like this, and you could go reasonably fast. Of course, you can't do this in a PC. What you need to do this is in some FPGA that then uh, has uh, four 18-bit uh, DACs for each of your two lateral effect photodiodes, and turns on an LED every 20 microseconds, and sends those eight values to an ARM core that's on the FPGA, and that ARM core calculates the th by triangulation the 3D value for that particular LED, and from that 3D value and the most recent three other points calculates a 6D pose. Is that clear? So, um, measuring the static performance is really easy because you could just see what comes out. And you could see on the bench, if you move it one arc minute, it will tell you you've moved it one arc minute. The trick, and what I want to spend the rest of the time on, is how do you measure this at speed? Because we were stumped by this. We thought we would need a other instrument that was faster than this and that was more sensitive than this. And the answer came during one meeting. I was discussing this with Mary earlier today. This is one of the reasons I love collaboration. I think it was, is Greg Welch here? Is Greg here? Okay, so he's not here. I think it was Andre State 
who came up with this idea, and Greg contributed to it, and the rest of us piled on. So here's the idea. You have a tracker. You know it's calculating 60 poses in your lab. Put a little laser pointer on it, okay? And then, even though that small motion, like you know you have, let me uh, do it on there, okay? If you move it even a small amount, like an arc minute, which is difficult to measure, you could measure that really far away with a camera, right? That's the idea. So now what we're going to do is the next idea. It says, look, suppose we put a thin yellow strip on the ceiling, thin like, say, a half a millimeter. Your laser pointer, instead of being on all the time, why don't you have the computer controlling it, and then when it hits that yellow strip, have it turn on, and when it's not, then turn it off. Okay, so then you wave this thing back and forth, and of course it's turned off, except, bing, it turns on whenever you happen to hit that strip. Everybody understand that? Not my idea, I think uh, Andre's and Greg's and some other people's idea, but I thought it was great. Now, so look, this works pretty well. In fact, it works really well when you uh, go at regular speed, okay? This animation due to Alex, who spent many hours on this. Okay, now, so if you go at slow speed, you go back and forth, you know, it's fine. It always hits that. Of course, sometimes you go past it because, you know, you're going too fast, whatever, but usually it works just fine. But what happens at high speed? At high speed, by the time the system calculates that it's on the yellow strip, you've moved past it, right? And how far you've moved is an indication of that time, right? Now, if you move faster, there'll be more latency, right? So, if you move even faster, then it'll be even farther. So, this is the whole idea. Okay, you move really, really fast back and forth, and you measure the velocity, and you measure the distance. Okay, because if you have the velocity and you have the distance, you have a measure of the latency. Everybody feel that? So, here's what we did. Here's the lab setup. Uh, here is this thing. You know, this normally would be on the ceiling and you know, you'd be sitting here, but of course, it's easier for us to work there. Okay, so, here is the track target and uh, Alex has added two more cheap laser pointers and these are just for measuring the speed and measuring the direction of the velocity. So here is what this looks like. I mean, just to give you some idea, a video pixel is like a tenth of a millimeter, okay? So here are these things that turn on. This is just for quadrature. Here is your main laser pointer that is gonna turn on at a yellow strip on the ceiling. Everybody with me? So then, here is what a video frame looks like. I don't know if you could see this. Some of you could see this. So here is the main laser pointer. We happened to catch it at a frame where it was right on this strip. Here you could see one of the timing pulses and the other ones you could barely see here. So let me show you a little bit better. Here is when it's the intersection point. Here are the timing ones and you could tell from the, these, the timing go at 400 hertz and you could tell by the distance uh, how fast the person is moving it, and you could tell by the offset of these whether it's going left to right or right to left. And here is the intersection with the yellow strip, and notice if it's going in this direction here, it'll be a little bit off to the right, and when the person's moving it to the left, then the dot will be a little bit to the left. And this difference is the indication of basically twice the latency. Is that clear? So, I have one slide of results. Are you ready for this? Actually, wait, no, I have uh, one more thing. Here is some sample video, okay? If, you, uh, if you're near the front, you could sort of see this blipping here, back and forth, okay? So let me show you uh, this close up. This is like looking at two millimeters of the ceiling. Yeah. Hold on, I want to show you millimeters of the ceiling. Uh, I may not be able to do it. Terrible. Okay. I think this will turn on 
This is a close-up of like two millimeters of the ceiling. Can you all see that? In fact, if you look carefully, if he's moving it slowly, then you'll see it brighter, and if he's moving it faster, then, of course, you'll see it dimmer. Because, you know, if he was not moving it at all, there's one place right there where he just, you know, didn't move it hardly at all, and you get a really bright spot. Okay? So here is one slide of the result. So here is now the strip. The strip is one arc minute. Remind you, one arc minute is the size of the one stroke of a letter in the lowest line of an eye chart. So that bottom E is made up of strokes that are one arc minute, so it's very tiny. Okay? Physically, it's about 0.8 millimeters on the ceiling, and here are the centroids of, of a thousand frames. Okay? So notice that he colors it here so that when he's moving much faster, then they get farther away one way or the other way, and when he's moving slower, they're closer. Okay? To give you some idea of the size, this is the size of a spot. Okay? So the size of the spot is you know, like one millimeter, and it hardly moves. This rate, by the way, is 10 times the rate that you could move, I mean, normally. When you saw those uh, teapots moving back and forth, those were at like 25 degrees per second. I mean, if you're moving back and forth like this, you know, that might be 100, something like this. So this is much faster than you would move, and still, the offset is something like one arc minute. Okay? So what you get from this is how stable this is and how little it moves. And if you calculate, in fact, you could do this as an exercise to the reader. If you calculate moving at 500 uh, degrees per second and you get about one arc minute, then what you get is something like 30 microseconds. And you say, well, is that, you know, 50 kilohertz? Well, it's... This thing is running every 20 microseconds, but then it takes like seven microseconds to do the 3D triangulation and to do the sixth day of pose, and it takes another two microseconds to figure out the intersection with the ceiling and one microsecond to turn it on. So about 30 microseconds to see these, okay? So there's a lot of things to do. This is just the thousand uh, spots. Okay, so there's a lot of other things that could be done now, like we could actually connect it to a display, we could check the kind of latencies that people might be uh, able to perceive. There's a lot of things to do to extend the tracking volume, to get wider field of view of lenses, to get more LEDs, more sensors. So the road is clear, it seems to me. If you want to build a really fast tracker and you're willing to build some hardware and FPGAs, you could build really fast trackers now, okay? Thank you. We have a couple of minutes for questions. I hope that was all clear. This is like half a dissertation in 12 minutes. I didn't do this good a dissertation. By the way, I should tell you that even though some of us are thinking about keeping Alex around for other projects, uh, he is looking around. And so if anybody's interested in a very capable, uh, mature student who knows how to do lots of different things, contact him. Does it have a motor? No. Wait a minute. Somebody could ask, answer that question. Does it have a motor moving it? Can somebody answer that question? Is there a motor moving this thing back and forth? No, it's some guy moving it back and forth like this. That's why, you know, it's like sometimes it's darker, you know, sometimes it's brighter because, you know, when he moves it slower, then it's a brighter spot. Yeah, he's just, he's just wiggling it back and forth, exactly. He's, yeah, basically he's wiggling it back and forth. Yes, the test method of wiggling. Any other questions? Ah, yes, yeah, so sometimes, yes. So sometimes he puts it on there because it's easier to have it, you know, go to the right place. But he could do this freehand. What's the range of the tracker? What happens if the person moves outside? Uh, a, a reasonable question. Um, in fact, what happens is 
that the CPU says, uh, if the person goes outside, then the centroid, uh, the signal strength goes down to like very low levels, and then the CPU says, this is not a good reading. So right now, it just throws out the reading, and it waits for another four times that are in. That's what happens now. But of course, you could do better. You know, you could do, um, like Greg Welch, you could do prediction and things like that, but he doesn't do any of that now. Okay? Thank you.